something more than trying to talk. Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, September 19th uh, meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is Jordan Haug and I'm the chairman of the board. Uh, also present tonight is every other board member, our attorney, our municipal secretary, and the building inspector. Welcome everyone. Uh, the application materials that will be discussed tonight, including any proposed resolutions and other documents, are available on the city's website. <clears throat> also on the city's website is a link to the rules and procedures of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll take a minute to explain the board's procedures. Um, we'll hear each application. Uh, tonight there will only be one uh, in the order it is noticed on the agenda uh, for each application. We'll hear first from the applicant, uh, and then the board will open the comments to the public. Yeah, everyone kind of knows the rules. This is a continuation. Um, so please be respectful. Uh, direct your comments to the board uh, and not to the applicant. No, no cross chatter, please. Um, first item, uh, has everyone on the board been able to review the minutes? Uh, and are there and is there any uh, need for edits and or comments and or deletions? No. None. All right, could I have a motion to accept the minutes from the- Motion to accept the minutes. August meeting, motion, can I have a second? Seconded. Second, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and uh, do you wanna wait on the other procedural thing? The- Yeah. It just sits now that it's adjourned and it's not gonna Okay, yeah, and then, uh, so uh, there is a, an additional uh, review. Um, uh, five, I'm sorry, 359 Cherry Street. That has been asked to be adjourned. Uh, so that agenda item, what was agenda item one? I'm not sure if that ended up on the final uh, agenda or not. That is, that will be not held uh, this evening. Um, and then I will ask for a motion to go in executive session for uh, advice of council. Can I have a motion? Motion to go in executive session. A motion by Montas. Can I have a second, please? Second. Second. Yeah, all in favor? Aye. 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 Elaine. 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 Just for the benefit of the board's council or, and, and others, we have a letter that we submitted to the board this evening. It's basically just to be illustrative of what we're going to present, but we figured it's easier to have physical copies of that. We'll be on the, you know, we, rather than putting it on the board, it's just kind of easier to have these things in paper. So it's not really a submission it's it's materials that we would use but we did submit it to um, the CBA secretary just so it's for the file All right, can I have a motion to come out of executive session, please? Motion. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and then just uh, one uh, housekeeping item uh, before uh, we continue. Um, there is uh, a tolling agreement uh, that was executed uh, last month, uh, which told uh, the applicant's ability to uh, file an Article 78 proceeding. Um, we're uh, through a date that's not in front of me. We're going to uh, extend that until November 16th, uh, 2023, with the ability to continue to extend. Uh, the thought process behind that is uh, we would want to have one uh, potential lawsuit if there is going to be one uh, in this case. Uh, can I have a motion to uh, approve our attorney executing that agreement, please? Motion to approve. Motion by Montos. Can I have a second? Second. Second by Stell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. And can I have a motion to continue the public hearing on agenda item number two, I guess? So moved. 
Motion. Second. Second by Elaine. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Palmer. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, welcome back. Taylor Palmer uh, with the law firm of Cuddy and Fader on behalf of the applicant. Uh, tonight I am joined by Jonathan Burns of Hudson Property Advisors, our financial consultant. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, we are before you in continued review of uh, our appeal of the interpretations made by the building inspector, and tonight in particular regarding our alternative request for an area variance uh, and a further alternative for a use variance. Uh, in a minute, as it pertains specifically to the use variance component, should we need to get there, um, I will ask uh, Hudson Property Advisors to address our financial analysis, which includes some details that we did, as I mentioned, uh, just submit to you all today. That, again, is sort of a spoiler of our presentation, but we thought it best to have that uh, available for your review. Uh, and that piece specifically relates to the minimum release necessary component, uh, albeit the reasonable viable return. <clears throat> so turning first to our area variance request, uh, at the board's, uh, after the board's August meeting, we did make a supplemental submission dated August 29th. Uh, that provided supporting details confirming that the first alternative uh, is indeed for an area variance as it relates to reconstruction volume uh, permitted, which is a clear dimensional requirement uh, and the physical requirements and not certainly related to the land use purpose. Um, so thus, in our position, it would be a variance to allow uh, the reconstruction pursuant to the uh, issuance of the building permit in lieu of the 50% limitation in Section 22310D. <clears throat> As we discussed at the August 15th hearing, uh, and we also detailed um, how the, uh, proper, the project will not be a detriment to uh, community character. Of course, it's located across from the same use uh, in, uh, across the street at 916 Walcott. Uh, we did a note in that supplemental submission uh, that and it was a question that the board had presented relating to community character. The court does indeed consider how long a use has existed uh, when considering its impact on the community character. So that's all in our supplemental submission, but we did just want to highlight that as this use has been there for nearly 100 years. Um, as the board is familiar, the goal here is to reconstruct the building um, that was part of the community character for nearly a century and then pursuant to the building permit that was issued for uh, the site. Indeed, the use variance resolution that this board granted for 52, 52 South Chestnut Street or the former Analect uh, Auto Body Shop noted that that restoration was uh, of a use that was destroyed, in that case, the Auto Body Shop. Um, and that did not harm the community character. So we're talking about the Analect Body Shop use variance that this board granted. Um, as the, this is quotes, as the property had been used as an automobile shop for at least 30 years. So that was part of the justification uh, for that approval for a use variance. Uh, so while we touched on it at the August 15th meeting, uh, the use variance for that form Analac Auto is important, in part because their council didn't know to pursue an area variance, and whether it needed to because a very well-known name in the community, um, but for other important reasons. If we must uh, get into those discussions, um, again, we're gonna present our financial analysis in just a moment, but we did uh, highlight the case law um, supporting that, indeed, the leaf before you is an area of variance. <clears throat> um, just by way of update, we did quickly sort of bring reference to, the, uh, to that uh, existing uh, use variance at our prior meeting, but we did uh, provide a formal supplemental submission to you uh, on August 29th that included some details to sort of allow the board to consider, I believe the chairman's mother may have been the chair of the board at that time, and uh, Montos and Judith, I believe you sat on the board uh, at the time of the issuance of that variance. Um, just by for the rest of the board members that weren't a part of that application, on or about September uh, 10th, excuse me, in 2011, um, an auto body shop was destroyed by a, a blizzard. Um, so the, the building itself was completely destroyed and the use itself um, was destroyed. Uh, in September uh, of that year, uh, the owner submitted a use variance application to permit the reconstruction of the use, and then that was ultimately granted by this board later in November of that year. The fact patterns of these two matters is certainly important. 925 has a lot of key similarities to that variance that was granted, specifically as it relates to the board's precedent in granting use variances to reestablish long, long existing non-conforming uses that are destroyed by causes that are no fault of the property owner, as is the case here. <clears throat> we note that the use variance that's at issue here uh, will have even less impact uh, from our perspective than the use variance that was issued for the Analac Auto, as the use to be reestablished at 925, which is a lesser intense use than was already existing on the property, is residential in nature. It's surrounded by other residential uses, while the use at the Analac Auto was a commercial auto body proximate to single family residences in a sim similarly situated single family residential zoning district. 
Indeed, that property is actually just a few thousand feet away from 925 uh, Walcott Avenue. <clears throat> Accordingly, by approving the limited variance relief that the applicant is seeking, the board is remaining consistent with its existing precedent regarding a non-conforming use is destroyed by an act outside of the control of the property owner themselves. Um, with those um, details, and we do have some more information to present, but I'm just going to turn it over uh, to uh, Mr. Burns to walk through our uh, supplemental submission, which we did provide on the 29th, and then, of course, the illustrative details we thought the board might be interested in as it relates to the minimum relief necessary, which is sort of an extension of our overall factors if we need to get to uh, the use variance standard. Jonathan? Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Chairman Hogue, members of the board. My name is Jonathan Burns with Hudson Property Advisors, and uh, you were given a memorandum that I had prepared uh, that I'd like to take a minute to walk through uh, with you. So what we were asked to do was analyze the uh, financial viability of developing the property under a variety of uses. Uh, the proposed action, which was a three-story building with nine rental apartments, and then we went to an uh, a same size building with eight rental apartments, a same size building with seven, six, and four. In order to um, make this a lot more, um, make more sense, it made sense to reduce the building size. For example, when we went to an eight unit building, instead of retaining the building size at 3670 square feet, which is what was proposed, uh, we used a proportionately smaller building size to see if that would be financially viable. We did the same thing with the, um, the seven, the six, and the four. In other words, proportionately, we reduced the size of the building based on the number of units. Okay? So that's why there's about eight or nine, uh, let's say eight, nine different alternatives that we studied. <clears throat> if uh, you want to turn to page five. I know the font is very small, and I apologize for that, but I was trying to fit it all on one page, and um, I should have blown it up much larger. I'll take a second to walk through the proposed action from start to finish, and we did the same type of analysis for all of the other alternatives. Okay, so in order to determine, in, in layman's terms, in order to determine if it's financially viable, first thing you look at is uh, construction cost and total site acquisition cost and uh, calculate the income that the property would be required to produce to determine whether or not it's financially viable. In other words, if it costs more to build it, if the return on the cost to build it is more than you're going to be able to rent it for, it's not financially viable. It's that simple. Um, so if you take proposed action from the top, three-story building, 3,670 square feet with nine units, construction hard cost at 275 per square foot, soft cost at 15% of that, total construction costs a million 160. The land acquisition was 650 total cost plus uh, 38,000 in demolition costs which were uh, required after the fire, demolition and removal of, uh, of the debris. So the total project cost comes out to a million eight fifty, at a cap rate of six and three quarter percent. That comes out to a net operating income of one hundred and twenty, roughly one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So it's like doing a backwards income approach. If you're familiar with that, once you have the NOI, the uh, with an expense ratio, and adding in vacancy rate, you can come up with what's called feasibility rent or the total potential rent that would be required in order to make it financially viable. So that number on the proposed action is 187000 and change. So below that are, is the income that the property could generate based on the uh, unit size, 303 square feet, uh, has a loss factor uh, based on the, um, the floor plans that we were provided with. And I think you probably have a copy of that. Uh, so the average unit size is 303 square feet. The projected uh, Income, the unit, average unit rental was 1950 a month, which comes out to $210,000 achievable income, which is $23,000 above the $187,000 that would be required. So that use is feasible. 
and it shows a 12.4 percent, basically 23,000 divided by the feasibility rent. So that shows that it's a 12.4 percent uh, 12 return. That exact same calculation was carried all the way across under each of the alternatives. Like I said, the alternative one is the same size building, but with eight apartments instead of nine. Then alternative 1A, it's a proportionately smaller building, uh, 3,262 square feet instead of 3,670 square feet. The same thing was done, alternative uh, two was seven units, 2A is seven units in a smaller building, and so on, all the way down to a four unit building. So what the analysis shows is that the proposed action returns 12.4%. Uh, the only other one that had anywhere near that was the alternate 1A, which is the smaller building with uh, eight units, and that's only 7%, which, and, and the rest of them, by the way, they're much lower. They're like negative numbers or, um, or one or 2% or something like that, uh, which is not enough to justify construction. So based on the analysis, the only one that made any sense financially is the nine unit building at 3670 square feet. Um, I know it's a lot to digest, and there's a lot in this, which I'm hoping you get a chance to read, but I'm open to questions if you have any at this point. So I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So this is a financial analysis against one use. Have yes. you looked at other permittable uses? This is the only time? use we were asked to do for this no, purpose. You were asked for no, no, for this study. Uses. That's what um, you were asked. What you were asked there's only use one use. It's a single family home, which we did in our prior analysis, and versus multifamily, and then there, that's the only use that's permitted. So then we evaluated the existing use, and then we took that, one of the extension questions that was brought up by the board, but we anticipated because the, the mention of if there is a, if the board reviewed or considered, which it does as part of the, the factors, the minimum relief necessary. So we wanted to ensure that what we were proposing as a minimum viable, economically viable use, that the use that we're proposing is that. So this analysis, the only uses that you would look at are the single family home and the use that we're contemplating, which is the existing use on the property that was destroyed Bruce, by the so fire. There are no other uses of that property? Potential uses? The other potential uses are basically single family houses, uh, places of worship. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, I think it was like a park. I think a park. It's pretty much limited to single family, to single family homes. Okay. Bruce, if you don't mind me asking, um, are there any of the special permit uses such as bed and breakfast, museum, social club, hospital, animal care, a university, uh, private school, any of these other uses that are permitted, whether as a right or, or subject to a special yeah, permit, are any of those feasible for the property or is the single family the only thing given the constraints of the property that's feasible there? Pretty much is the only single family use is the only really feasible use, of the use property. there. Yeah. Okay. Um, beyond that, it's really anything else that would go there would require some form of special permit, either by the um, variances you know, the for board or the or the city council or variances for development things like that. Yes. Okay. And if I may, just for the record, use variance analysis does not consider specially permitted uses. It looks at only principally permitted uses. <coughs> Another question I have: You were asked last time to answer the question if any insurance money was given back. I don't see that in the financial analysis. So I can answer. I can address that. So there's a number of questions that the board brought up and, and it was concerning the reasonable return test. So I can give you sort of a layout of that and then I can kind of give you the, the cheat sheet of those specific answers as the board might see fit. So just by way of background, I wanted to sort of lay this all out. And it's generally provided in our materials throughout, but I thought it might be good to just highlight that because this goes back to our original submissions going through the tests the factors that are considered from an area variance and use variance of course what we're talking about right now we're, we're contemplating sort of the use variance discussion and we're kind of jumping between those and that's why we're talking about the financial analysis this is particularly relevant to a use variance standard the viola, the minimum relief necessary i mean that's in both standards area or use but when we're talking about the financial analysis it really is exclusive to the the use variance test but just for the benefit of the board a landowner that seeks to have a use variance must illustrate factually by dollars and cents proof. That's uh, oh, right. Um, 
that there's an inability to realize a reasonable return under existing permissible uses in the zoning district. So we just talked about how the only permissible use, notwithstanding the existing non-conforming use, is a single family home. So the dollars and cents evidence that is used in this analysis comes from the Court of Appeals effectively. They've sort of laid out um, in subsequent decisions types of illustrative things that the board can look at when making those determinations. That some of those include the amount paid for the property, the value of the property, income from the land at the use or land at issue, expenses attributable to maintenance, taxes paid, mortgages, and other encumbrances. That's that's a general list. I'm not saying that the insurance payout. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute as it relates to all of those. Um, while they each have their unique factors, um, they've held that financial loss doesn't equate to um, uh, a reasonable return. So when we look at the analysis that we've submitted, um, so I'm just trying to, to, to make sure I'm, there's a lot here to kind of get to the question you've, ha you've asked, and I don't want to confuse the issues. Um, so we've shown that the, that the construction or sale of a rental or single family home on the premises would not, uh, would result in a loss for the applicant. Um, based on the dollars and cents evidence that uh, we've utilized, um, namely showing the zoning feasibility in our August 28th submission, um, which looked at the purchase price of 650. Um, sorry, this is this is not going to address. So, it's I don't want to. get, It's going to be a long answer. Are you okay with me sort of trying to tie it into the? It's the, the insurance payout was 977, 977,000. So I'll, I'll start with I'll start I'll start I'll start with the, the the actual question and relay it back because it has no bearing on what you're considering. So I'll 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 explain that momentarily. Can I ask something in yep. addition to it? Is that the amount it was originally insured for? Because um, we would really like to know what insurance he. It says the insurance pay, that was the that was the payout, and then it was there was a ten percent fee for the public adjuster. Those are the those are the details that I have. Yeah, I have all I have taxes and mortgages. I've got fire cleanup costs, the monthly income before okay. the work began. But somewhere there was a policy that had an amount on it of what he insured that structure Of course. For. So and that's what we'd like to see. Yeah, the question, yeah. We want to know if it, the payout was reduced at all by any factors. Sure. That we'll have to submit to you in a supplemental. We don't have that specific sure. factor. And, and Taylor, not to cut you off, but if whatever we ask for tonight, we can always provide a list so that we make sure. Yeah, I just, I just want to be clear. The insurance payout has no, I'll, I'll tie it into the, the background. So let me just sort of explain with the purchase price, with the, the construction costs, with the feasibility analysis and all of that, how it ties into this um, adjustment um, piece here. And of course, this is going to be something much easier to lay out in a formal submission. But anticipating these questions, we wanted to try and at least tie it back. So looking at the dollars and cents evidence, uh, namely our feasibility report that was submitted, um, which looked at the purchase price of $650,000. No single family home comparable this to nearby single family homes could be reconstructed and sold even at a conservative construction cost of $275 a square foot, that would not result in a loss. So with a sales price of $1.9 million, which is the highest surveyed home price in the analysis that we submitted, construction and sale of a single family home would result in a loss of $138,000. So let me continue through the feasibility analysis. This is laid out in our submission, but without... Tell, tell just, so yep. I just want to understand what you just said. So you're saying that... If you, so you've already, obviously 650 is locked in. It happened in the past. Right. You're saying that what it would cost to build a single family home, and if it's sold for the highest value that a home is sold in that, neighbor, in that neighborhood or in wherever, whatever radius you used, it would need to sell for 1.9 million? Or what was your conclusory statement there? So, it's just that there would be a loss in the se in building it out for the use that we're proposing. Sorry, as a single family home, building that out, there would still be a, a net loss. If what? What would be a net loss? If you built it out and then what? And then and then it sold for what? I, I get my point is is. I, I guess I'll have to address it separately. I'm. I'm not, but I feel like math is not going to be my my best suit here. That's why we have our financial consultant. So. I have a question for the financial yeah. consultant on what he just projected. Well, do you want me to finish the, the yeah, presentation I relate, on... I want it related to that. So what you just presented to us is a house has to sell for 1.85, you have it here in writing, in order to get a rate of return of 12.4. And in there, you're including a soft cost of 5%. 
you're including a vacancy rate of an additional 5%, you're including a loss factor of an additional 26%. You're saying in order to make a 12.4% return, you've got to sell the house at 1.85 million. No, this is not a house. This is a nine-unit apartment building. I apologize. Alternative one. The alternative one. You're saying you have to sell. You you have to 1.85 to get to get that rate of return, right? No, that no. That's project cost. That's what you have to invest in. So, all right. What this is saying is this: at 275 dollars hard construction cost, mm -hmm. plus 15 percent soft cost, plus the total cost of the site of 688 mm -hmm. is total project cost of a million eight fifty. Got it. A return on that, fair rate of return, six point seven five percent, uh it's cap rate rather, not a fair rate uh, gives you a net operating income of one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Typical expense ratio is thirty percent, which means you'd have expenses of roughly fifty three thousand, which translates to an effective gross income of one hundred and seventy eight thousand with a 5% vacancy rate, the feasibility rent, in other words, the rent that you'd have to be able to rent it for to make it justifiable, minimum, would be $187,000. Got it. Okay? With you. Okay. Thank you for helping me understand. Sure. So I know it's backwards. That's why it's... So I, I think we conflated two things, though, right? Because your, your statement and what I was drilling down to was, was talking about a single-family home, which this... what he's speaking to is not multifamily. correct right. okay that's our that's our august 29th analysis which i just pulled for jonathan to review <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> so i just want to understand what <coughs> you're saying at least we again we know the 650 is locked in right so my the question i have is what does your analysis say because i don't have it in front of me the, it would cost and then what do you need to sell a single family house for for what do you need to sell it to to break even? Okay, so let me look at this. And it's been a while since I looked sure. at this. It, but uh, when when we prepared this, I was not aware that there was the thirty-eight thousand uh, dollar cleanup fine. cost. So that six fifty should be six eighty-eight. Oh, that's really okay. Good. Sure. And it was thirty. Sorry, it was thirty. Thirty-eight thousand dollars. And that was demolition. Cost. Demolition yeah. and and uh, mm -hmm. cleanup. Yeah. Um, so what this is showing is that uh, with a 650,000, I use 650 site cost yep. at $275 a square foot construction cost. Um, and sa same construction cost for a commercial building as it would be a residential single family? Roughly the same. We use the same. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> we compared the total cost of the for the low the high the average and median house sizes reading across the board uh one million two ninety six two million two one million five okay is that, and we is that is, are those sales prices or, or, or no that's total development cost uh-huh okay and we compared that to the low the survey we did a low high average and median sale price right okay so we compared that the the low to the low and the high to the high so to speak so for example the survey low was three hundred forty thousand dollar sale price which means you lose seventy three percent the survey high uh was a forty eight hundred square foot house that sold at a million nine and even that uh if you built that forty eight hundred square foot house your total cost would be two million two. You can only sell it for a million nine, so you'd lose three hundred thousand dollars. That's what that's showing. Except, except, the, uh, so, well, except the insurance. Sure. Is not so you're saying that it would cost two point two million dollars. Does that include the acquisition? I use six fifty, but I should I should have used six eighty eight. Correct. So but my so six eight. So you're saying that the cost of construction is the delta between those two? Yes. The the the, the, the cost of construction is. Right there, it says uh, total cost including site acquisition. I'm looking at the second one, the high. See, it says survey high, 4807. Yeah. Okay, so that's 2,038. That should really be plus $38,000. Um, so that 2 million, I'm sorry, 2,034 is, 2,204, I apologize. 2,204 
is the total development costs for a 4,800 square foot house. Okay. Okay. But the high that we should we found for a house around that size was a million nine, which would mean that you'd lose three hundred thousand dollars. Sure. And now Taylor, I'd like you to explain because I'm sure you have an answer why we don't get the count the nine seventy seven insurance payment against that. Nine ninety seven. Yes. Nine 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 seven seven four hundred. It's only nine seven seven. Yep. Nine seven seven four hundred. So generally speaking, this is not something that we're we're, we're listed as the factors in determining whether a non permitted or permitted land use is feasible on the property. The, the analysis that we prepared for you is looking exclusively at if there's a reasonable return on the investment. The applicant spent, you know, he has construction loans. Um, there was a loan on the property to purchase it. There's significant encumbrances that go along with this as well as the cleanup and other costs that were expressed to develop the site. So while it's... But, but those, are in your, those are in your analysis, correct? That's, that's part of the, uh, the, the... No, it's part of the 2.2, right? All, all the costs. Point two is the land plus the construction costs. The two point two is the six fifty plus two seventy five a square foot. But the land wasn't six fifty. The land was only one fifty. No, he paid six fifty plus so he paid another thirty eight thousand. For the house, for the building, for the building. When he bought the property, he bought the entire property for six fifty. So part of that was land, part of it was the structure. But that's n but the, the building's gone. So right. his so cost of that site. The insurance in lieu of that building. I'm saying his cost of that site was six fifty. Right. Plus he had to demolish. Uh, pay so Taylor, you're, you're, Taylor, you're saying that the court of appeals is has, is has directed uh, zoning boards to not consider insurance. Well, so you, in so I think so. We're, we're not saying that it's if you're considering in the analysis, we're looking at this from what can be built on this property right yep. now. But we're also considering. But, but, we're consi but, you, but if we're considering how much he purchased the property for and what the demo was, how, how are we not considering the insurance payment? Again, we're, we're focused on something that isn't considered as one of the. And you can turn to your council to ask that same question. I think that's better probably directed at your council of whether they sh you should be considering the insurance payout as this as, as, as determinative. What what about the insurance payout to pay for the loss, to pay for the uh, the, the destruction? What what about that is 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 up is questioned by the board about whether there's a reasonable return? We're talking about what can be built on this site. It's a vacant property right now. It's a, it's got a foundation of a destroyed building. We're trying to say that we can't build a single family home on this property where there would be a reasonable return on building that use. And thus we need, at a minimum, we need the nine units that we're proposing, which were existing on that property and assured rents for a period of time. This is not, this is not a one fixed payment, take, take a, you know, go away and, 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 and set sail. This is looking at what can be built on the site under the existing zoning and what was on the site for the last hundred years. So, I, I think you asked a question in there, and I, I think that's you are you are doing your analysis and making your argument based on a commercial building that has continued returns, right? And so, correct. That's right. That's your argument, but the, that there's a permitted use of a single-family home. So, the so if we're doing so if we're doing an analysis based on a 2.2 million construction cost and acquisition cost and whatever, we we have to consider the fact that your client. Was paid nine hundred and seventy-seven thousand four hundred dollars. Sounds like we need to provide more information about the acquisition cost, the loans, all the other components to this, and detail an extenuation of how the reasonable return is about the highest and best use of this property, not about the insurance payout. Not one, a one, you know, all of these things get worked into these costs. We'll have to adjust the analysis to account for this delta that I think the board is struggling with. For your example, just for the benefit of the board, in the analysis that was done by this board for the Analec Auto Body Shop, it said that an 8% return on, on was, was necessary to realize a reasonable rate of return. Our, our position based on the submission is, I think you said closer to 12, but that's, we're looking at, there's no set number, but that is the, 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 the argument and that is the uh, justification that the board used at that time on a similarly situated property with a non-conforming use that was destroyed by, in that case, weather. So we're looking at, you know, what this site can be built as and constructed, and, and that if we were to build today, we couldn't realize a reasonable return by building a single-family house. That's why we're before you. I, I don't need to go all the way back to why we're before you. We believe we could do this today with the building permit that was issued. The building inspector issued a determination saying that we can't. None of this discussion even takes place if 
this is indeed an area variance. So I just kind of want to walk it back for a second to that because this factor is exclusive to the use variance discussion. So I think council, we had presented it and we had submitted in our, our, our files that this is indeed an area variance application. So this discussion needs to happen and we can table that, I think incorporate more details to the use variance about the insurance payout because that seems to be a, a sticking point for the board. We had listed out all of the, the, the other sort of individual itemized questions which we tried to incorporate into the study and in the August study. But again, this only comes into conversation if we're talking about a use variance. If it's an area variance, we're not getting into um, the details about the reasonable rate of return. We're looking at whether there's a hardship and the other factors that are associated with this, which this is a perfect example of, uh, of really, you know, if you all bought a property today and you had somebody come burn it down, I imagine you would be in the same position as our client. So, you know, put yourself in his shoes when it comes to buying a property, trying to renovate it, trying to reduce the nonconformity and having it taken away and then told you can't rebuild it. You can build a house. Taylor, I have to say this because I was on the board at the time, okay? Do we agree or disagree? Every case is unique, yes? And considered individually, Of course. Yes? Okay. Yep. The analytic property, just for the record, that was commercial, non-residential. It wasn't the same as this from that perspective. Was that 100% destroyed? I, to the best of my recollection, I don't believe it was 100%. It was 50%. So those are two key factors that differentiate the difference between the intellect property and the current property today because you keep honing in on that set precedence and almost implying that this is identical. So I just want to put out there for the record, I was on the board. Judy was on the board at the time. I'm not speaking for Judy. I'm just speaking for my recollection. They weren't 100 apples to apples. Sure. So one was commercial and 50% destroyed, not residential and 100%. Understood. Case. And I would just have you look at the photos that we submitted. It was gone. The building was gone. I did look at it, and I do remember from then. Right. So just for, by way of reference, you know, precedentially, I, I understand your distinction saying it's a commercial use in a residential district, which I think by definition would make it much more nonconforming than a residential use in a residential district. That's just my presentation. All we are saying is that in that instance, the board looked at the history that it had been there for 30 years. Yep. It's explicitly in the, in the record. The quotes are there from the board itself and making its decision saying 8% was the necessary uh, minimum viability test for that particular use. And it also looked at the, the history of being in that part of the community and not impacting community character because it had been there for 30 years. Right. But again, a commercial use in a residential district, we are a residential use in a residential district. And we are, again, reducing that nonconformity from 16 units down to nine. So we're respectfully more, <laughs> less nonconforming or less impactful than would be a, 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 an auto body shop. I, I don't, that's hard to, hard to argue that a multifamily use would be more impactful than a, a commercial auto body shop in a single family residential district. So just to reiterate, you're going to update your financials to reflect the 990. Only if the board needs to proceed to a use variance analysis. So again, we've we've submitted, uh, you know, second department case you, law. You didn't let me finish. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, you're, you're going to update the financials to 977 400 to reflect the insurance, but you're also going to get us what the insurance policy total was. Right. Yes, and, we and we'll that. also probably distinguish why that isn't part of this analysis, but we'll certainly incorporate the, those materials because they've been requested. Got it. And, and just so I can chime in on this, uh, Taylor's point is valid. If, it, if, if it's an area variance in the end, this reasonable return is obviously sure. an irrelevant conversation. <coughs> At this point in time, we have not gotten a final answer on that. So just for the sake of efficiency, we are proceeding, uh, and you know the board is free to ask questions on the air, on the use variance, with the understanding that we could very well come back next month, and it might be an area variance. Taylor has submitted some some cases. We're still researching, so just for the sake of efficiency, we are analyzing it. I think Taylor understands mm -hmm. that. I want the public to understand that there's no necessarily locked in decision right now. It's just there's no need to come here and stand around and wait. It's let's proceed with the back half, and then you know consider the front. And I just want to and make just, a comment about yeah, please. Um, yep. South Chestnut Street. Yep. South Chestnut Street, it's kind of like a transitional area. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Rocco's is right there, which is commercial. Right across the street, another auto body mm -hmm. shop is there. So it's, it's, not, it, it's not as residential. It's a few hundred feet away. I, I know. Listen, and we're, listen, we're right down the street. <laughs> It was we're, my neighborhood at yeah. the time. So. And Judith, you know we're right down the street from the city's affordable housing develop, you know, and, and we have a lot. There is multifamily from Creek Drive. We are it, there's de saying, different development pressures. Of feet, there are other commercial buildings. It's not far off Main Street. And I do want to have one one zinger for Montos. Do you know if the insurance payout was requested during the review of the uh Analog Auto Body application? I don't recall. 
All right, but we'll we'll look into um, those materials for a supplemental. I know it's the public hearing, and if the board wants to more questions for us or wants to turn it to the the right. audience. I was just speaking to you saying that it was more residential. It was more, it was it was more non-conforming. I I. I Say you might have an argument. With Absolutely, that. and I and I and I would also suggest that 916 Walcott Avenue is the exact same use directly across the street from our property, and of course, you know, the, the, nothing. Beacon is a it's it's a, a cool amalgamation of all kinds of things, yes. right? That's what why we all love it and why we're doing the things that you, you see happening. It took a lot of legislative policy to get there, but you know, effectively, it's it, it's. That's why these things, the development pressure, it's like, you know, nuisance law and everything came and, and farm protections came from people leaving the city, moving next to a farm being like, oh, those cows stink. Let's get them out of here, right? Coming to the nuisance. This is not, this is a multifamily building that had been there for 100 years and development around it has taken place, but it's a combination of affordable housing, the most dense development in the city, you know, just feet away down the road and other development pressures. But I, I appreciate that. that that comment. Taylor, um, are we suspending your presentation on use for now? Like, are, are you going to, I guess I should ask that. Do you want to speak on any of the other factors? We only spoke obviously on reasonable return, or do you want to just? Well, I think we did present them at the, the last meeting, but if there, Mr. Chairman, if there's a specific inquiry, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to do it, or if the board sees fit in the economy of scale, so to speak. I'm, we, our position is it's an area variance. We've sure. submitted the support for that, and again, we're not, we're in an alternative seeking that other relief. So if the board wants to go through that, we can. Um, but I think it might be best, well, it's, you're, you're, the, you're yeah. the director, Chairman. Um, no, I think we're, well, I think there's a question that we can ask in your area variance presentation that I have that, that, would, that would matter either okay. way. Um, so you can proceed. Okay. Um, so I, I think that really, unless Jonathan had, I think he, he's presented his report. Obviously, we're going to submit that to the board as a, we've submitted it, but we'll provide it further and I think supplement it to Montos's and um, Elaine's questions specific to the insurance and how that has any parity to the to the, the test that's before you. And then, you know, that would be if we get to the use variance analysis. Just want, when Please. you talk about a reasonable rate of return, I, from your numbers, you're saying it would be between between eight and twelve percent. Yes, for the from the when we looked at the multifamily, um, when we did sort of the analysis of the alternatives from nine units mm -hmm. or eight units in the same size building or eight units in a smaller meaning shrinking the unit, so to speak, that was where we were able to, 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 to balance that. And in our submission, you know, ultimately we're, our, our position is that seven would be too low, which is the eight units at a smaller building, and 12 would be the reasonable return for this investment. Um, you know, sort of, again, looking back only as the only evidence we have really when it comes to those percentages, it's, it's the board to determine the percentage. Um, we just relayed back to that 8% because it was something you have in history here but there is no set percentage it's not 10 it's not 20 it's just one last question for me uh, and I don't know if this was just um, an error or not are you using the, uh, the words feasibility um, and reasonable return synonymously or is there a different definition so Feas feasible means if it's a if you can make a penny over you yeah okay that's feasible but is it viable is it financially viable would a developer do it for a one percent return sure so that's the distinction so, so your table here is showing it if if you could make a cent it would show feasible correct right but right. obviously you're any not positive number is technically feasible but it's not financially viable unless sure. it's a decent percentage okay okay Right, and the test, as the chairman I think was alluding to, is the applicant cannot realize a reasonable return, provided the lack of return is substantial and demonstrated by con competent financial evidence. But it's a good distinction. We'll make sure to clarify. I'm also. Uh, <clears throat> could you provide us with if there are any mortgages or liens on the property, yep. um, the amount of taxes that you've paid, also 
all your expense and carrying charges. I know you added the cleanup charge. I don't know if there's any others. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I'm shaking, but I realized the microphone doesn't pick that up. I think you get the idea. We, we, you know, if, if if we're looking to discount the insurance payment, we want all the expenses too, right? So we can give you a fair shake whether, you know. I agree if we have to get to the use variance analysis, that would be helpful. Area variance. <laughs> Do you want to proceed on? The, well, area, the area variance. So we did make a formal presentation on that before, but if you'd like us to go back, I can go through that discussion. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about it at all further. Um. <laughs> to the extent, I don't want to put Taylor on the, on the spot, to the extent that sure. he submitted the, the sure. support of that, I, I don't want to be premature. Um, yeah, I can, I can go area. through it. I have the presentation. I yeah, just it, Taylor, if you want to, you can. I, it might be, it, it might not be necessary. I don't Great. know. Okay. So I think probably it, up to you, Taylor, you want to rehash all those points, but they are in his written submission. Um, unless you have anything to supplement to that. No, we, we highlighted, I think, one of the comments that came out of the last meeting was community <laughs> character, and I, we, we, there was a question specifically or a statement that we can't, you know, the building's gone. We can't look at it, but the court explicitly provides that we should and do look at, and considering impacts of community character, the longevity of the use on the site. So we, we incorporated that in the submission. We, we can, we'll plan to do this submission, assuming council confirms our analysis, which does confirm that it's an area variance. We'll plan to present that as though it never took, that our area variance discussion, just for the benefit of the public, they don't have to look back to other videos to get our support for that. Sure. But that's not, you know, for purposes of a supplemental submission, we're probably not gonna do more to the area variance. We're just gonna address those should the board need to get to that, meaning for a use variance, the other questions about insurance, taxes, and the like, um, should the board need to get to that at that meeting so we'd be ready to present on both fronts. Okay, so I just have uh, one question for Bruce, and then I'll allow the rest of the board to ask questions to anyone, and then we'll open it up to the public. Um, Bruce, there was a discussion at either, either of the previous meetings of unauthorized work done at the building prior to the issuance of a building permit. Do you know the extent of that? There was a comment, well, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I'll, <clears throat> it was two different instances where there was work done without a permit. Uh, the first one was the front porch on the building. Can you talk into the mic? Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, first, the first instance was when they took off the front porch of the building. Uh, Dave Buckley was the building inspector at the time. He had placed a stop work order. Um, in regard to that work so they had to go through a process with him you know to pull permits um, you know and then they were allowed to move forward <clears throat> when I took over probably about a month I think it was a month after I had taken over um, I was actually asked by the health department to go out there because they were doing an inspection um, that's when our office had found that he was renovating the inside of the building um, he had most of the top floor gutted and part of the second floor as well. Um, at that point, we put another, we put a stop work order on the, on all the work that was going on there. And then we were trying to work through the process to, you know, move forward with a building permit to stay, to, to renovate, you know, again, it was the upper, it was mostly for the upper floors, but they were doing some work on the first floor as well. So it was all or mostly demolition work that was done at the at, time? At that time, yes. It, when we, well, actually, no. There was some reconstruction work um, when we had caught them, which was, I believe, in November. Before a building permit was issued? It was prior, prior to them having a building permit. So and then the applicant. There was, there was reconstruction work. There was plumbing, electrical, um, some framing that had been changed. And so just to understand your process, um, on a building like that or on a single family home, you know, a small addition or whatever it is, your process is to do what? Our process is you need to have a building permit prior to the start of any work. Meaning your enforcement 
your enforcement process. Oh, the enforcement process? Yeah, if you could just explain that briefly. If the okay, so the enforcement process, if we catch you doing something um, without a permit, yes. we issue a stop work order. Right. Um, and at that point, it's up to the owner to come in and apply for a building permit. And through that process, um, we have to hash out whatever issues are um, that have to be addressed. And then once they've met all the requirements for the building code, um, to show that they're going to be in compliance, you know, when they complete that work, we'll go ahead and we'll issue a building permit to go ahead and do the work. What is the consequence, uh, hypothetically, uh, if if someone were to complete a project without getting a building permit? What would happen in that instance? Um, they would have to turn around. They would have to basically take out yeah. a permit at that time to legalize the work. Um, possibly have to. Um, you know, we do have some fees, but they're really not uh, additional fees that would have to be paid, but they would have to pay for the full cost of the building permit, um, and possibly if it was felt necessary, depending upon what was done, they may have to go to either the planning board or zoning board um, you know, if there was work done outside of something that I couldn't approve. Sure, and uh, the only time uh, a court would get involved as if they violated a stop work order is that correct um, no technically I could I could write them a ticket for you know doing all that work and that renovation work if we felt you could have so yes if there was there was a ticket was issued here oh, an there, was. Ticket. there was an appearance ticket the applicant well, the, the appearance ticket was because the applicant refused to clean up the property so the fire, after the, the building fire was destroyed place right yeah. that that ticket was given because the Applicant was issued an order to remedy after the fire. We gave them 30 days to clean up the property. Um, after the 30 day period had passed, he still refused to clean up the property. So our, our, our action at that point was to have to take him to court. And, and just for the record, the applicant was waiting for the insurance payout, was in contact with the building department, and did put up a fence at the request of the building department when waiting for the permit, which we've yeah, discussed. After, after the 30 days. After the 30 days, but what again was in communication with the building department, was trying to work that out. Just want to make all that very so clear. So there, was, there was no communication. So right. Bruce, was the right. work ever corrected? And this was all before the applicant was represented was by corrected and council. Was the work, I didn't hear. So you said there was some reconstruction going on involving plumbing, electric framing. You noticed that. Did they ever bring it into compliance or do it right and get a building permit? No. What well, they, they got a issued, building permit. When yes. they were issued the building permit, the fire happened shortly after it. So we had issued the building permit to let them go back to work. At that point, then they can go ahead and they would start straightening out everything that, you know, that needed to be straightened out and then also move forward with the rest of the work. Um, but we never got as far as having an inspection because the fire had taken place. And, and so, and just to be clear, it, it, it was when, within your authority, um, but you use your discretion not to issue a ticket based on the construction alone. Correct. Okay. But the applicant proceeded as a, so before prior, the applicant had not been represented by counsel in connection with any of the work prior to the issuance of the building permit. The, we, our office was only contacted once the fire had taken place and the building inspector had issued a, a stop, work, a, a, a violation for not cleaning up the property and had issued the determination that the use could not continue when, when the building permit was resubmitted to rebuild the use. That's when we were contacted. Since that time, I think Bruce can attest the applicant has other properties in the city. He has been, a, we have represented everything um, to the. Yeah, we don't want to talk about the other properties because it's really, again, we've caught them in both, we've caught them in both of the other properties working without a permit as again, well. Again, prior to represent, they have not since those times been, since they've been represented, since they, they've been, again, this is a very this different. Is, <laughs> yeah, just. Yeah, it's sticking with the uh, it sticking with this property. Stick to this sure. because again, yes, yeah. he is in the other properties. He was caught doing work without a permit as well after the 925 incident. So okay. that's so that's that's the fact with that issue. There was no yep. he wasn't going to come in until after we caught him. It, he was going to continue <clears> down that path, see how far he can get. And there, and there was a comment, and I don't know who made it at a previous meeting that the and I don't know if it was. I don't know if you made made the comment or if it was uh, possibly Bruce that the fire may have been accelerated by the gutting of the building. Yes. Was that was that conclusion 
made by you? Is that conclusion made by the fire department? Was that conclusion made by whom? I'd say the fire department made that conclusion. Um, the fire did. The fire did spread very quickly throughout the building. Again, it was um, with with no sheetrock on the walls and the dry tinder wood. It you know it basically spread pretty quickly through the building. Right. And the applicant has applied for and was would have needed sprinklers to in the new construction. Is there? Does the fire department issue a report when they yes, analyze? The, can we get a copy of that? Um, yeah, I can reach out to the fire chief to get mm -hmm. a copy of the fire report. And, and just for the record, I'm not sure the, rel the the question line of questioning how that relates to the area variance factors or the use variance factors, but I certainly appreciate it, the. It speaks to self created hardship. Of course. If he did an action that would have furthered, that would have created. Just to be clear, this was a individual who committed arson who poured gasoline, uh, again, it's all documented and committed, it's all a public record of, of, a, of, of the act. So I'm not sure that any, well, I don't need to speculate more than the board needs to, but to say that it's self-created by having someone else burn it down is, um, that, that's a true stretch, Mr. Chairman. I think what would be helpful is a copy of that report and then a timeline of events from the day you, I guess, had the health department contacted you and you found out the stop work order, uh, and then the issuance of the permit, the fire, and then the issuance of the appearance ticket. If we could have those four or five dates. And we'll inquire to the applicant yeah. about what work was done pursuant to the building permit that was issued prior to that fire as well. Great because that would be permitted and was trying to better the conditions, including installing sprinklers. Sure, if he, if he could also submit what he did with previous as well, that would be great. Okay. Any other questions uh, from the board? Hit them all. All right, then I will open up uh, to public comment. Uh, we'll sure. limit it to all one second. You read the list too before they start talking. Read the list of the public comment. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm she's up there. So I want to get up here before my battery goes dead. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, I just I just find it time. kind of amusing you, that he doesn't want to submit documents, but he wants you to give insurance. I just hold for one second. Um, you were mentioning about limitation of time. Yes. And also speak into the microphone for everyone. Um, because sometimes we Can you be my timer? I'll try that. <laughs> so we'll do my name is Teresa Kraft. I, I live in Beacon. Thank I'm you. very concerned. Many neighboring and city residents have spoken out on this application here in City Hall through public comments, letters, petitions, and in the media. This is our last chance to show this board, the mayor, and council just how passionately opposed we are to these radical densifications of Beacon's neighborhoods that are not realistic. I, realistically ideal for overdevelopment with a stroke of pen granted area and use variances. If you do not stop it now, it cannot be undone and will only spread to other neighborhoods. Hopefully you'll, you're too smart to fall for the scare tactics. There is no affordability component to any of this proposal. <coughs> Replacing a non-conforming use structure with a new build non-conforming use structure is not justified. Re replacing the, what fire destroyed is not going to solve a housing shortage. It's wishful and needlessly destructive thinking. Instead, get the city t to be progressive in building affordable housing elsewhere, but don't destroy our single family neighborhoods by shoehorning this back in where it simply doesn't belong. Please deny this application. Contrary to Mr. Palmer's statement that the city's new development is all good, I hope he only speaks for himself. A lot of us see crappy design builds. I also believe the non-conforming building stated tonight by the applicant's attorney to use as a comparison for as, as of right to have a similar non-conforming use building is a mute point as it, I believe it's owned by the same applicant. Have we learned, and we did learn the fire value, so I think he's already reaped a benefit. And just uh, for the record, my kitchen alone is um, 400 square feet, so I feel sorry for anybody who has to be crammed into a, a 303 square foot space. Thank you.
We're just going to limit comments to three minutes, for the record. <laughs> Montos is keeping time. Hi, I'm Lisa Wagner, uh, 66 Sargent Avenue. Just two, two light comments uh, from this evening's discussion that I appeal to the board with. Um, the first one is, regardless of use, regardless of variance, regardless of all of these things that we're looking to make exception for on this property, my biggest concern with this as well is the integrity of the investor looking to make the exceptions, um, you know, the professionalism, law abidance, conformity to laws and policies and protocols. It's not a good track record I see so far. And it gives me great concern that we may end up giving an allowance for this project to move forward with someone who I don't know if we can trust in our best interest to do what they're supposed to do with that property. Um, so that's just my first comment on this, uh, hearing what I heard tonight. My other question that I'd like to pose to the board from the financial aspect of this is, I'm very curious how much the owner of the property would be willing to sell the parcel as is, as standing, with no further construction and change of title. I'd like to know what that number is. Because there may be a consortium of individuals who might be interested in taking this off his hands. So I'd be very curious if he would be interested in presenting a number like that to the residents of Beacon. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Charlotte Woodward, 821 Walcott Avenue. Um, proud uh, resident of Beacon, historic river town that's losing that beautiful thing that we all love, people that have been here for a long time, the historic river town. The average price of homes now in Beacon, according to Zillow and Realtor, $500,000. That's half a million dollars. Um, in listening to all that went on, I'd like to comment and say that I do agree that the comparison with the Antelac situation and this is, does there is no comparison, two separate different things. Um, and also to say the 925 was in use for 100 years as a boarding house. I've never seen evidence of that. I've tried reaching out to the Historical Society. That would mean that in 1923, that beautifully architecturally special home was used as a boarding house. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I'm also saddened to hear that the person involved with the development of this property or wanting to be is working on other properties without permits and to piggyback onto what someone else just said, that's not a very good track record. And as a homeowner in Beacon, I don't understand, and people that sell and buy in Beacon, are we guaranteed a reasonable return? Are we guaranteed a guaranteed return? When we go to, say I went to add on to my house and I didn't do a very good job and I took a loss, who is protecting me? Where are we getting this reasonable return? Is anyone really guaranteed that? I don't understand that. And I guess that's all I want to say. The other thing I found, oh, one other thing, with all these numbers going all around, it's very confusing. If you look on realtor.com, it says that the property was sold in 2022 for $50,000. It says it right on there. I don't know why. I'm sorry? Sorry, across the street. No, it said 925 Walcott. I'll, get, I'll print it out for you. Okay. Yeah. No, it's just very interesting. But I'm, I'm just very concerned about this guaranteed rate of return. Uh, half a minute left, please. I think I'm done, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Malinger, Colo, 66 Sargent Avenue. 
I would just like to piggyback on your conversation with Bruce about the work that was being done in the short term before the fire. Besides the violations and, and not having the permits, there was also work being done after hours at night, weekends before time was allowed. And we know this because we are the house right next to it. So I would constantly hear the work going on. Obviously, you guys can't be there all the time, but living next door, we saw. So just a point of information, that was also going on, on top of all the other violations. And there were also rumors, again, rumors of unlicensed workers. Don't have any proof of that, because, but that was also the things that we were being heard, because we live right there, and we care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meg Oaks, 913 Walcott. Um, oh, move it down. Is that better? Okay. For you, I think. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I know with the financial hardship, um, the way I see it with all, I see it in a less convoluted way as far as if the house was purchased for 650 and the insurance, I think the insurance should count. That's paid money. 900 and I think it was 950, um, 970, um, and then subtract the. Um, I think it was 68,000 for the cost of cleanup. I may be off on that amount, but there's a certain amount. Um, and then the land itself is worth about 100,000. So I would say, with the point that that you made, um, it could be it could be um, you know I, at least even if not some money made just. I don't understand why it has to be based on what could happen. What could happen, what you could build, and how much money you could make when you have the facts in front of you that, you know, how much was paid out, how much did you put out, and also the rent itself that was taken in, how much rent was taken in. Um, that a lot of, there's a lot of missing information that should be part of, you know, the, the, judge, the judgment. Um, that was my main um, point. Um, I was going to, I think they talked about Chestnut, but I was also going to add about Chestnut that it, it seems like a very different neighborhood um, as far as comparing it like that. And thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. My name is Brittany Mustakis. I'm at 80 Sargent Avenue. Um, as you may know, I've already written a, a long letter, um, so hopefully you know my concerns already. There's just a few things that I wanted to make clear. Um, I obviously opposed all variance requests, and I think we just have to wait to hear back for the area variance, which I still don't think is applicable. Um, I'd just like to address the building permit, since that's what we're basing the new construction on. Um, the building permit for the renovations for this property last year, I believe was in violation of the zoning code because it increases the nonconformity both regarding the building and the use and increases the value over 25% as a change from SRO to multifamily designation. I was in, I'm within 250 uh, feet of this building and I was unaware of this change. Um, I was unaware of, you know, a lot of the illegal activity going on. Um, but uh, I thought that they were just maintaining, up, um, maintaining condition, sound condition to continue operation. Um, but the change from a boarding house to multifamily apartment buildings with amenities in each individual unit violates the zoning code and it's not a reduction, but it presents a huge impact to the neighborhood, which would also apply to the area variance. Um, sorry, I'm shaky. Um, it's clear that they bought this property um, with the intention to make a big return without considering these limits. Um, they did not, this did not go to the zoning board. There was no public hearing. And in response, they said that they were just simply going to clean it up. So we don't need one problem to replace another. The amount of parking, traffic, safety issues, disturbance that this would create is significant when considering this is a single family zone. Um, so according to zoning code section H, uh, the surrounding, left, I'm sorry? One minute left. Okay, I may not finish, but 
Um, section H states that the surrounding neighbors can um, uh, register a complaint, which is what we intend to do if non-conforming use is granted in any scenario, whether it be a variance or lawsuit determination or anything. So I just wanted to add that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Pizzoni, uh, 949 Wolcott. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, one simple thing about with a 12% return on the property's um, <clears throat> use at 330 square feet per unit, they said that they, they need $1,900 a month rent. That just seems, even in this real estate market, improbable like it just doesn't seem to make sense to me thanks thank you thank you just a uh, two things or if I can remember it the one thing I name remember name name and address oh I'm sorry Charlotte Woodward 821 Walcott Avenue during the time that the construction or the refurb was being done in that building um, those residents were displaced um, including the person that committed the arson that's number one and the second thing I sorry did didn't come to me but I just wanted to point that out and I am really against any variances and I guess as a former uh, fifth grade teacher I don't understand why we're even using the word non-conforming if it's non-conforming it's non-conforming just follow the law I don't think that would make sense to a fifth grader thank you for your time thank you Hello, I'm Norma Manningweather, 923 Walcott Avenue, next to 925. My house was the house that caught on fire at the time also. Um, my, my thing is, I just feel like we do not need any multi anything in our community at all. Single family homes is what should be there. And I think they should also rebuild, but rebuild as a single family home and not nine, 10, 12 apartments because that's gonna turn out to be the same thing. Nobody's gonna pay 1,900, 2,000 for 350 square feet. Nobody gonna pay that. So they're gonna end up being um, right back to where they started from. You know, renting out as rooms or bringing in migrants so they can get the money from the state, the city, and they, it's gonna be an issue. It's gonna be a problem, it's especially for me. I'm the closest one to that house. It's gonna be a whole lot of nonsense, noise, fighting, traffic, and they're not gonna take care of that property. They're gonna let those people just run around ragged over there. They're not gonna take care of the property. They're not gonna take care of uh, anyone who create a problem and put them off the property. They're gonna be there constantly making noise for myself and other people in the community. And I applaud you to stick to the single family home. And Newburgh can use you guys. Bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I think that's everyone. We have a lot of in, in emails. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. Gonna, that's where I was going to go next. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, into the record um, a bunch of emails. Um, James Case Leal, uh, Stephen and Meg Oaks, uh, Joseph Ayers, Brittany Wistakis's novella. Um, and then uh, additionally, there was a petition that was submitted that had uh, a bunch of signatures. We just wanted to acknowledge that they're all in the record. Um, and posted, uh, we, we have read them. Uh, and uh, Taylor, would you like a final word? 
right. I think that's it. We appreciate the comments. You know, certainly submit a supplemental um, to incorporate those materials and, and certainly address comments related to the area variance or the use variance. Uh, George, any other things we need to do? No, the, the tolling agreement I'll get to you tomorrow. Um, to we'll sign that. Um, obviously, the public hearing is going to remain open. We'll be back next month. If if you guys come up with anything else you want, um, you know we can always be in contact with Taylor. Uh, let's make sure that everything that's requested is provided, and vice versa. So next month we, you know, yep. don't have yeah. something happen. So, so and, Taylor, and just be on the lookout for any emails <coughs> or anything. Like right, that. and just obviously, I'm sure you took notes, and we'll rewatch this video. Uh, <laughs> but just for the public's, uh, I guess. You know, we, we would we want pretty much a, a PNL, uh, an entire PNL, and then uh, if you could get us the information that I asked, so um, that timeline and possibly the uh, report from the fire uh, from the firehouse as well, that would be helpful. Um, at this time, uh, we also want the total insurance coverage policy. Yes, yes, and a copy of the total insurance coverage policy. Um, at this time, I will ask for a motion to adjourn the public hearing uh, to the October meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So moved. Motion, motion by Judy. Can I have a second? Second. Second by Montas. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Just for the record, Mr. Chairman, just the date certain. Um, sorry, Mercedes. <laughs> date certain of the meeting? Yep. Uh, October 17. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll see you then. Okay. We adjourn the meeting. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. <laughs> and a second. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.